Well, welcome again to another Uncork Conversation. And uh, tonight is going to be an excellent conversation with a friend of mine, I, I guess a colleague on some level. I want to introduce you to uh, Ray Beefus. Ray, how are you doing tonight? I'm really delighted to be here, Tim. We've been a friends for, uh, I don't know, a decade. Yeah. And uh, so we've re recently connected and it's been uh, really invigorating for me to reconnect with you. Awesome. It's been great for me as well. And for, just for our listeners to know, so I'm, uh, I'm in my home office uh, recording near Toronto and Ray is just outside of Grand Rapids, I believe, right, Michigan? Absolutely. That's right. So it's, an, it's an international uncork tonight. So let me give you a bit of background history to our relationship, the way I see it, Ray, and how I experienced it. And you may have a different, some different perspective on that. But I had the privilege of connecting maybe with your wife, Carol, first, possibly. I can't remember if, if I met you and Carol at the same time or maybe Carol first. But I had the privilege of, of sitting on a board uh with 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 ray and with carol his wife for a number of years and we we partnered together in work in africa particularly in zimbabwe which was just a lot of fun and i learned a lot in the process i had an opportunity to experience ray in those in the in another culture and watch him work which was a real privilege and i'll, I'll tuck into that a little bit maybe a little bit more now uh, later i should say um, but when we look at it right now, our present connection is kind of unique. Uh, about six months ago, I had a vision to start a, a network of consultants, coaches, trainers who would get together for mutual encouragement. And as I began to look at who I would invite, um, I just felt like very strongly I needed to reconnect with Ray. And we hadn't chatted for a long time at that point, but I had fall, I've been following you on, on Instagram, which you're a bit of a, you're, you're an Instagram like a hero to me. Every time I see your posts, I get inspired and then I have to post and then it's like a post war or something. I don't, I don't know what happens there. So, so we got reconnected and, and now we're part of this network and that's where the genesis of this conversation comes from tonight. And I'll, I'll, I'll let our listeners into that a little bit more, but just by way of background for, so for people to understand. So for over 30 years, Ray has been working in nonprofit organizations in leadership capacities. Uh, and that was the capacity that I first experienced Ray in. Uh, Ray has added to that um, uh, a, a lot of studying that he's done and some certificate that he's gotten as he's moved his career in the second piece of his life in a different direction, which is in this coaching consulting world. And this is the world now that we encounter each other. And, and so Ray not only has, uh, uh, is a member of the International Coaching Federation, but Ray is also a, a authorized solutions provider for a, a tool, an assessment tool called Harrison. And Ray can chat with you a little bit more about that. You're happy to talk about that tonight. I can personally vouch for that tool. Ray is coaching me right now. And that's been exciting. One of the things I invest in for myself is coaching because I want to get better. I want to, I want to be a better person. I want to find my blind spots and I've got a ton of them. And after a while, I'm a fairly strong personality. Not a lot of people in my life are always willing to point out my blind spots. And so what's been really great is working with this tool with Ray is it's identified some places of opportunity for me to develop, for me to grow, and to, for me to ch embrace change in my life. And so excellent tool, and I've really appreciated working with, with Ray on that. On a personal level, here's what I want to say about Ray. And Ray, I hope you don't get embarrassed by this, but... The word I think of when I think of Ray Beefus is the word winsome. Now, winsome is not a word we use a lot in our culture anymore. But winsome people, uh, if you just look inside that word, there's this sense of joy. There's something uh, that you just, you, when I encounter you, Ray, there is a joy about who you are, about your life that is captivating. And so winsome is a word that comes to my mind. In addition to that, you are a, a, an amazing communicator. And I've seen you communicate with small groups, individuals, large groups. You're a phenomenal communicator. And in my opinion, a true statesman. Now, not a politician, but a true statesman. Because I remember being in circumstances with you in Africa and watching you work with groups of people and bring them together. And so the word state, statesman comes to mind when I think about you. You're positively encouraging, but you are not a pushover. So even though you're, you're, you're joy filled, you're winsome, you're a true statesman, you're encouraging, but you're not a pushover. And quite frankly, here's what I would say. If I was warning anybody about Ray and encountering him, here's what I'd say. Ray will quite kindly, 
very kindly, in fact, stab you in the heart with truth. Now, here's the thing I know about Ray. Not his truth, but your own truth. He will take your own truth and he'll stab you in the heart with it. He'll stab you in the soul with it. He'll stab you in the psyche with it. But like a surgeon, it's a wound to heal. And that's the way I would characterize even my, my last couple coaching sessions is that I leave it feeling, feeling wounded, but wounded in a way that opens up the possibility of healing like a surgeon. So I don't know, Ray, if that uh, resonates with you, if it makes you uncomfortable, but that's the way I see you, Ray. Wow, there's some drama for you. Uh, uh, surgery for sure, but uh, with the stabbing in the heart, stabbing in the eye, what'd you say, stabbing in the kidney? I mean, we're, all that stabbing talk, you might need to pour us a drink, Tim. I might, I might have to pour a drink, but, yeah, but again, what's the difference? Does the body know the difference between a knife wound and a scalpel? No, I think, I think the only difference is the intention of the one wielding the knife. That's really the only difference. And so I know when you cut me a little bit deeply with a question, and often it is, it opens something up in me and it provides the potential for something new to develop and grow. So that's the way I see the process. It may not be how you intend it, but it's how I experience it. And I really love it. I really appreciate it. Well, my experience is that high capacity people really want to grow. They want to go to the next level. They want to take responsibility. They want to discover their, their blind spots. And so that relates to our conversation tonight. Oftentimes, high capacity people invite um, truth in a direct manner, and they're eager for it so that they can get on their way to the next level wherever they're going. Yeah, fair enough. Now, as you said, sometimes to prepare yourself and uh, to, for this conversation and for the conversations that we have, a drink is in order. Now, of course, not when you're, we're doing coaching, but tonight we're having a different conversation. And my listeners know that I do believe that all great uncorked conversations do begin with a drink. And when I asked you what you thought we should drink tonight, you had a very interesting twist on that. And while you tell the listeners why you chose this drink, I'm going to pour myself one way you do it. Well, we met uh, over trips to Zimbabwe. We were feeding the soul of Africa, working with leaders, working with churches, working with anybody who would have us. And uh, actually, gin and tonic goes back to the 1700s when the British Army was occupying parts of India, or all of India, parts of Africa, and malaria was a threat. And so it was discovered that quinine, which was part of a big part of tonic water back then, actually uh, prevented malaria. And so because quinine was so bitter, the British soldiers would add lemon, lime, and gin uh, to sweeten it a bit. And so the gin and tonic was born in Africa. And so like Stanley and Livingston, here you and I are lifting a glass of gin and tonic saying, God save the queen. I like it. Cheers. And by, I've been watching The Crown lately. So God save yeah. the queen. The Crown's a good show. If you are not watching it, you should watch The Crown. <laughs> awesome. Listen, so with that in mind, and, and that's really great history because, you know, again, our connection came, was born in Africa and, and one of the challenges in Africa, like all other, like our culture here, is that it's not always as direct and maybe forthright as it should be. And that really leads us to our topic. And I want to explain the genesis of and how, why I wanted to have this conversation with you, Ray, tonight. So about a month ago, in our network, in our Fervesco network, um, the group had asked, petition Ray, uh, if he would do some teaching and training for us and facilitate a conversation around this topic. And frankly, it was so brilliant, Ray, just the way you had that conversation, the, uh, your, how you articulated uh, how to have difficult conversations and how to have them well was absolutely brilliant and extremely powerful. And what was great for me is that, in fact, the morning after that you did your initial training with us and, and had that conversation, I my first coaching session of the day, the following day, was a gentleman, and it started started with his question that 
I have a, I had a really difficult problem and I got to have a difficult conversation. And when it came out of his mouth, I was like, Hey, I'm ready for this because Ray Beefus last night equipped me with some great ideas. And over the last month, I found myself several times reaching back into some of the ideas that you presented in and using them in very practical ways to help some of the people I work with have that complicated conversation, that difficult conversation. And so, so that was the genesis of this conversation. I was like, you know what? Why leave that to that small group of 12 consultants? Why not open that up to a broader audience and have that conversation with you tonight? And so that's, that's the background. So with that in mind, Ray, help us understand how you see difficult conversations, what they are, and how, how do you equip me or someone else to understand them and have them well? Well, Growing up, I, mean, I was never trained by my parents, not by a teacher, not by anybody in college. No one ever trained me to have difficult conversations or complicated conversations. But uh, going to Africa to get together with you introduced me to the need um, where we desperately wanted to help people. And they, they were very, very eager to um, receive what we had to share but we had, our stories were so different. Our perspectives were so different that um, offenses could easily take place. Misunderstandings could easily take place because of how different our worlds were. And while that was magnified across the ocean and uh, transatlantic cultural differences, the same thing is true in our world. When we're in a difficult spot or a complicated spot with people at work or at home or wherever we are, we might think the other person's wrong, the other person's bad, the other person's selfish, the other person's you know, nearsighted, whatever it is. But the fundamental challenge is the difference in our stories. We've grown up with different experiences. We've uh, made up different rules about how relationships, life and work should be handled. And so when the issues become significant, when um, temperature begins to rise, we tend to think the problem is this person sitting across from me when actually it's our different stories, it's our different experiences, it's our different perspectives, how things should be. And that's the same thing that's true in Africa when the, the Americans come for a visit, it's the same thing here between Americans and Canadians, it's the same thing with me and my wife. We have different stories, different experiences, different rules. And so when something complicated comes up, we have to take a different approach than simply fighting to overpower the person sitting across from us. So the context that you're going to talk about tonight is, is a life context. And obviously this touches into also the, the corporate world that your clients work in uh, because of your practice as a coach. Uh, obviously, you're, you're brailing into that world more and more these days and in, in, in porting what you've learned in, in, these, in these social circles and in, in these spiritual circles, where, which is the primary circle that you worked in the past. And now you're porting that into a business circle Is there true connectivity in all those worlds or is the business world fundamentally different somehow i wish it was but uh <laughs> in every world we go we live in uh it's we're dealing with people and uh so the similarities just uh our work work if you know if you learn how to handle difficult or complicated complications at school at home or at work the value transfers to every other realm you might find yourself in um so so much of what makes business succeed moves it ahead is understanding the the human connections. And so much of my work as a coach and yours as a consultant trainer coach um, has to do with the human factors that differentiate one professional from another. They might have the, they both have the same education. They might have the same credentials, um, but one is wildly more successful than the others. And I, you, you wonder why it's almost never around technical ability. It's around their ability to relate well to people, to uh, make progress through complicated conversations and uh, move the team forward together. 
And so, yeah, it's a big value in, in business. In fact, most of the books I've read have come out of the business world um, and have been very, very helpful to me. Is this, are some people just more well-equipped by personality or by nature for these conversations, or can anyone learn to have a more productive, uh, complicated conversation with somebody? I'm sure that there are people like, you know, doctors or surgeons, they have a temperament for surgery, uh, but they've got to study, they've got to practice, they've got to hone their skills and uh, become certified in different techniques. And I think the same thing is true for us as people. Some of us maybe have grown up in a home that's given us a greater self-awareness, a greater self-confidence for wading into things that are full of stress or tension. But I'm confident even a growing up in a, an unhealthy home, growing up in a, you know, as an introvert, being very uh, isolated, being very careful, I've learned uh, enough skills to be able to walk into the most difficult relational situations peacefully and calmly just because I have the tools. And uh, that's so helpful to us. If we don't know what to do when the temperature rises in the room, we don't have the skills we need. Of course, our stress is going to be go through the roof and we may dive in inadvisedly or we might withdraw and isolate and not say what needs to be said. Mm -hmm. And so basic tools are fundamental to success in communicating in complicated situations. Hmm. You know, and I think that tucks back into to the observation I made earlier about you being a statesman, in my opinion, because I can remember observing you in certain situations, whether it was in Africa when we were on the ground or whether it was in, when we were in North America in board meetings at times. I remember watching you handle different uh, personality styles of people who were more or less aggressive, more or less forceful, um, you know, not for bad reasons, but for great reasons, because we're all defending our passions and trying to figure that out. But I but I remember watching you in those those times and and, you know, frankly, being a little bit envious of how you could broker that and and do that. Now, now I understand your magic because you've taught me that you've taught me your magic now. Now I understand the magic you were using, which really wasn't magic. It really was the disciplined application of some principles and ideas and strategies that you clearly had learned. And now you're teaching others. So so. That being said, help our listeners understand uh, what, you know, if you're going to share some things with them that help them understand how to construct that conversation and or what they need to, what they need to have in place, what they can, what equity they need to have, what, how does that work so that they can set this up so that it is for the benefit of all to have this kind of conversation. Sure. Well, let me start with that line about equity, Tim. I think to, in order to enter into um, complicated conversations effectively, we really have to develop relational equity, depth. And so leaders, whether they're parents or uh, they're at work, managers and, and leaders, uh, we need to go through life developing relationships that are strong enough to carry the weight of our vision. And when it comes to complication, it means our relationships are strong enough to uh, dive in the deep end and talk about the stuff that's really going to make a difference rather than beat around the bush or circle the, you know, with the wagons and become defensive or attack. We really have to have solid relationships. And so it's worth talking for just a bit about the kind of leadership or management that builds a bridge for conversations that will follow. And I think, um, you know, certainly a leader or a manager sharing fears and longings, sharing struggles and failures, as well as goals and successes, opens up the opportunity for everybody to go there. And when we, we're conducting difficult or complicated conversations, we're often invading that zone where fear lives, where all kinds of um, stresses, uh, take root and feed off of fear. Um, and so uh, it, it just behooves any leader or manager to go first and saying, I'm going to communicate with my team members in a, the most human manner possible. 
by sharing my longings, my fears, my goals, my successes, and letting people know that no matter what comes up in conversation, I've been there and there's room for you to be human because I've already revealed, revealed my humanity. And so these kinds of conversations do go best when a leader, a manager, a parent, a spouse has already developed some equity relationally. Hmm. And do you think, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Do you think the average leader struggles a little bit with that proposition in the sense, do you think they see it that in and of itself as an expression of weakness? You know, it's very generational in my experience that certainly going back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, post-World War II leaders um, made a clear distinction. This is work. This is not personal life. Let's not get personal. Let's keep it professional. But as the generations have changed and management has shifted uh, to uh, bringing out the highest levels of engagement in team members, um, the perspective on this has uh, shifted dramatically that our employees are people and they bring their personal lives to work. They take work with home, them home, just ask their spouses and their kids. And so this dichotomy between uh, what I do in my private life and what I do at work is completely false. We are who we are everywhere we go. And especially as uh, Gen Xers and millennials now are filling in the ranks, they want to be themselves at work. They want to be respected for who we, they are, known for who they are, and um, management techniques or leadership uh, techniques that actually emphasize our common humanity actually raise the level of engagement, uh, which is uh, you know, the difference between me complying to what I have for what I have to do and me committing to my work with my whole heart. This human factor is essential to that, Tim, at least in my experience as a coach. Okay. So, no, and that's, that's really, you know, and as I think about it, it makes a lot of sense. I think about my son, uh, who's 27, my daughter, who's 31, and I look at what they, I think, find attractive in the leader. And it's, it, it is that there's a certain attraction in vulnerability in the humanity part of it which I, I come from a generation, you know, being 55, where that really wasn't the same when I first started in my career. You know, you, re, you really weren't rewarded for vulnerability. That, let me just put it that way. It really wasn't the highest thing on the, uh, on the reward chart was vulnerability, but it is definitely a changing world. And so if we were to think about uh, maybe this sort of foundations and frameworks, if we think of those two words, so foundational idea, which is this, this creating this relational equity and, and, a, and a human uh, sort of soil to plant the seed into. That's a foundational principle. Are there any other foundational principles that would, people would need to understand that will help them uh, and put them in a place to have these most difficult conversations? Yes, there are. And let me just say that um... I'm borrowing a great deal of uh, what I think and what I say from two books. One is called Difficult Conversations by a Harvard work group, uh, Stone, Patton, and, and, and Meek, um, as well as Christopher Voss on uh, Never Split the Difference. Mm -hmm. One is on complicated conversations. One is complicated negotiations, but there's very similar. Mm -hmm. But here's a foundational principle. Every difficult or complicated conversation is actually three conversations uh, interwoven together. And that's one of the complexities here. The first conversation is, you know, the facts, what, what happened, what should have happened, what didn't happen, what I want to have happened, the, just the facts of the case in this breakdown. The second conversation is the feelings conversation. I'm upset. I'm afraid. I feel um, berated, I feel exposed, I feel like uh, the whole project's been challenged or undermined or waylaid. It's my feelings. And then the third conversation and every complicated conversation is, what does all this say about me? Am I the hero or I'm a fool? Am I um, on my way out? Am I gonna lose my job or am I just gonna be treated humanely? But, um, what does this say about me? And so when you go back to Africa or you go to the boardroom today, anytime the temperature heats up, 
there are three internal conversations going on in people. The facts, what should have been done, what didn't happen, what could have been done, the feelings, how I'm feeling right now being put on the spot, how I'm feeling right now being confronted by something I didn't see. And then the third conversation is, what does this whole thing say about me? What do they think about me? Am I an idiot? Um, am I uh, second class? Does my opinion even matter? And of course, that internal conversation, that third one is an identity conversation. And I, I really can't get the answers to that from anybody in the room as to who I am. I've got to go to my therapist or I, I go to God or I, you know, I go to my mom, but they can't answer that question. So I have to make sure that doesn't set me off balance. Hmm. But it helps to know that the other people are having that conversation. Does Ray think I'm a fool? Does Ray think I'm clueless? Does Ray think I don't have any value? And so I've got to attend to that feeling, that reality and everybody I'm talking to. But here's the interesting thing, Tim. Generally, the feelings conversation is the core conversation in any complicated uh, situation, hmm. even for men. That men's feelings get hurt. They feel threatened. Men they have feel, feelings? They feel wounded. <laughs> Uh, you know, they, they lose hope, they get discouraged, they, they rise up in anger and, and defensiveness. Yes, men have feelings. Anytime they become defensive, it's not over the facts. It's over how they've been feeling in the, the conflict. And so one of the foundational issues is knowing that the most valuable conversation you and I can have in a moment of tension is about how you're feeling and about how I'm feeling. And oftentimes when that conversation is had and re resolved, the whole thing goes away, which is remarkable. And so often what happens in a conflict is we just try to overpower each other on the facts of what should have been done, could have been done, uh, had to be done. And now because it wasn't done, this is going to happen. And actually there's no, there's no, uh, no gold there in uh, at least at this point in the conversation. Yeah. I have to come to grips with, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm afraid that we're not gonna reach our goal. You're feeling angry that you're getting pinned with something that you don't deserve, but our feelings are both uh, putting us on edge. And that's yeah. great news if you're aware of it and you can speak to it. Yeah, cause I mean, for, I mean, I think of myself, I mean, I, my, by nature, I'm, I'm, I'm much more geared to the fact conversation, you know, just give me the right. facts. That's all I'm really interested in. But so, so how, how do you take a person like me who maybe has, has a bent towards that more of that fact conversation and seeing that's the epicenter of the conversation. If we just know the facts, we can move forward and we can touch them all and figure it all out. Then it, then it works. How do you, how, what, what counsel would you give me if I want to move from being a being that fact conversation guy into how how do I have how do I have a feeling conversation and in a way that's genuine and that makes sense to me like how do I do that right well I think the first thing is just to um, drop my assumptions about you that I know you that we're on the same page that we look at this through the same framework I really, you know, I'm getting to know your story, but your story is very different than mine. Your perspective is very different than mine. And I have to drop my assumptions about what this is about for you. And uh, it means a couple of things. First of all, I need to distinguish between intent and impact. And I, I might, maybe I see you dialing up, maybe I see you, you know, pounding the table with facts and marshalling all kinds of facts together to try to prove your point. And, and uh, maybe it's hitting me in a certain way, but I don't know your intent. All I know is the impact. It's like, wow, Tim's upset with me. Tim's uh, going someplace. I didn't realize he would go. Uh, I'm starting to feel out of control with Tim. I can't predict where he's going next. And so if I decide that the impact on me is actually what you intend, that's a first, you know, uh, left turn into a, a field where there's nothing but trouble. 
Uh, I don't know if uh, listeners are, uh, you know, just aware of the, the attribution, fundamental attribution error, but we fall into it uh, commonly. And it's this, if I do something bad that upsets you, I'll explain it with circumstances. Hmm. I'm having a bad day. Sorry, I was a little, friend, uh, you know, I didn't mean it. I had a little short tempered. My wife did something on the way to work, you know, I hit a dog. I mean, I, and you know, I'm behind. And so I attribute my breakdowns to circumstance. Hmm. But the error is I attribute your breakdowns to character. Huh. <laughs> you meant to hurt me, you bad faith, you know, lack of self-control, uh, hidden agendas. And so uh, at the very beginning, I need to just drop my assumptions and say, I don't know what Tim intended. This is the impact on me and it's negative, it's hurtful but I'm not gonna attribute that to the, his intentions. I'm gonna wait and see what he intended. Hmm. Yeah, you, you didn't follow me around earlier today, did you, by <laughs> chance? Because I, now I feel like as much as you, t you taught me this a month ago, I, I think I, I've got a lot of learning to do. So you probably followed, around, followed me around today in several conversations. So yeah. yeah, that's a great point, you know, intention and impact, I, I, I gu I'm guilty of interpreting impact as intention. How yeah. I felt it is how I believe you meant it. Exactly. Uh, I, I, and we and, all fall wow. into that. Yeah, that and I, you know, and as you say it, it it makes a lot of sense in my head, but right. it doesn't make a lot of sense in the moment sometimes cuz cuz you feel that thud, you know, in your chest of that comment mm -hmm. or or whatever's happening and it just feels like a punch in the gut with right. intention to hurt. It's true. I, um, but that's, that's a really great point. And I would say this, if any of us, of us were given a, uh, the assignment to speak publicly in parliament or at the United States Congress, I mean, we would prepare, we were going to speak to all the shareholders of our company. We would just prepare. We would choose our words wisely. We would make notes, but we don't often do that with complicated conversations which can often have more impact on our future, our careers, our company success than any formal speech we would ever give. And so this is where um, many of us came into the business community and leadership with some naivete. Mm -hmm. We just didn't know how much uh, practice this would take or how much awareness would take. We've never read a book on complicated conversations or negotiations. And so we, we go in, we hope for the best, we get paralyzed by the stress in the room, and then we, we uh, choose tools that are pretty dull. So one thing is just to drop our invitations. If I'm in a difficult moment with Tim Windsor, I get to decide that it's my opportunity to get to know the man at a level I don't know him. Clearly, he's coming from a different place than me. And one of the things I enjoyed about one of your previous a podcast on Martin Luther King Jr. was the statement that the man had no enemies, not blacks, not whites. He had a cause and he was all about the cause. And to master complicated conversations, we have to decide there are no enemies in the room. Hmm. There are just people with different experiences, different perspectives, different rules, and we get to know them better. But the win here is not beating them. The win is moving together with them into the future. And so that changes my perspective. They are not threats to what I want. They're my partners. And now in this moment, I get to know them better so that we can come into alignment together to achieve something that matters both to, to both of us. But this, this leads to a second point. Not only do I avoid the fundamental attribution errors that they intend to hurt me or they intend to make my life miserable. <laughs> I don't know what they intend at all, uh, but I'm gonna make this a learning conversation, an exploratory conversation. And I'll just say something like, hey, clearly we're seeing this differently. We're coming at this with a different set of values, a different perspective, why don't we just explore our stories and how we got to this point? And I'd like you to go first. Um, I have a point of view, you have a point of view, but I'd like to hear from you. 
about where you think uh, the apple cart tipped over, why, and how you experience it, what you think it means. And so I invite people to tell me their perspective, where they think we're at, and um, begin telling their story. And in this way, we avoid just starting with blame. Um, and that's often where it goes when people get tense, when uh, rules are broken, it's just your fault. You're this, you know, you're just an idiot. You're undermining the whole team. You're, you're robbing us. You're wasting time, da, 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 da. And there, there's nothing there for us. There's no gold uh, to be dug up. But in a learning conversation where we say, I want to know what's most important to you. I want to know what's most upsetting to you. And I want to understand why. What, what's at stake for you? And then I get to listen. And I don't listen forever, but I listen well. And so I'm listening for what they want. I'm listening for what they need. I'm listening for what they think the stakes are. And along the way, I'm validating them. I'm empathizing with them. I'm noting their emotion. And uh, I'm also declaring my intent. Like, I'd like to solve this with you. I'm not just here to win the argument. I'd like to come out at a place together where we're partners and we're seeing the problem more clearly through each other's eyes. Hmm. And Chris Voss has written this wonderful book, uh, uh, Never Split the Difference. He was an FBI uh, a negotiator here in the United States. And at the top of his field, business schools like Harvard Business School began to invite him in to help leaders think about sales, think about leadership, think about difficult leadership moments. And uh, if any conversation it's complicated, it's with a, a group of robbers in a bank or a group of terrorists, you know, holding a bomb. Yeah. And uh, you've got to listen. What is it they want? What's at stake for them? What's in their way? Uh, how are they feeling? Where are they at emotionally? Uh, as well as intellectually, what's their purpose and what's driving them. Okay. And so in any diff difficult conversation, I'm, I'm letting the other person go first and tell me what they think, what they see, how they see it. And uh, then I say, well, let me share my perspective. Um, I didn't see it that way. That wasn't my intention. Um, this is what I was after. This is why I think it matters. And now what we're having is an exploratory conversation that helps us both look at how we contributed. So instead of assigning blame, you did more wrong than me, or you did, you know, this was your fault. Now we're exploring how did we both contribute to this? And wise leaders will always um, go first in admitting they, con they contributed. And so you think about any breakdown that happens at work, leaders can just be too busy. They seem inaccessible. They seem like they don't want to know. Um, you know, if I see something, you know, train wreck coming up, they're too busy. They don't, you know, they're too busy, whatever. They also might be too gruff. They might, uh, there, maybe there wasn't any onboarding around handling conflicts or appealing upstream for, you know, consideration, but, Leaders always contribute to the breakdowns um, in some fashion. If they're humble, they'll look for them and they'll go first and they'll say, you know, Tim, I, I can see that I've been traveling a lot. I've been half moving through the hallways like a tornado. I haven't seemed too accessible. I guess I haven't been and I haven't wanted to be because of my own stresses. You're right. This could have been avoided and I have to own that. And so if the leader goes first and actually um, can see ways that he contributed or she contributed, then, then the leader can ask, how do you think you contributed? And now we're mapping out a contribution system instead of you know, blaming. Hmm. Uh, how did sales contribute to this? Or how did you know, HR contribute to this? And how do we now build a plan that includes both of our perspectives and can take us to a place that we couldn't have gone without seeing the problem through each, 
through each other's eyes. Hmm. No, I mean, you know, I mean, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. I think the ch challenge, obviously, part of the challenge is really understanding um, that the goal is to emerge out of this on the same team. And, you know, I, I as you're talking uh, now, I'm having a thought that I didn't have a month ago when we had this conversation with the whole network. And that is, I'm reminded of some writings by Scott Peck. And, and I th you know, Scott talked about this idea of the tunnel of chaos in one of his books. And he, he basically said, you know, on the one side is conflict and inauthentic relationship. On the other side is authentic relationship. And he basically said, the pathway between the two places is, is, is that tunnel of chaos, the place where we go in, we fight it out, we, we figure it out, we fight it out and figure it out. But he also made an interesting observation. He, he said, you, you're not, you don't go into that tunnel with anybody who you really don't want relationship with. So, so maybe the desire, even the desire to have the difficult conversation is actually a positive thing because when I'm done with you, when I want to cut you off and I'm finished, I no longer need a conversation. I don't need a difficult conversation. I don't need that complicated conversation because I solve that complication by, by cutting you out of my life or my business or my team. And so even the desire to go in and have these conversations is a positive expression of the desire to continue to journey together at some level, which is what I'm sort of beginning to see in this picture you're painting. That's absolutely right, Tim. When we avoid difficult conversation, there's often a, a, an unconscious judgment about the other person. Mm -hmm. They're not worth it. They don't have what it takes to handle it. They don't have the brain power to solve this. But often there's a negative judgment be, behind the withdrawal from conflict, healthy conflict and resolving tension and uh we actually dishonor people when we avoid engaging them in a healthy and direct manner like they don't have what it takes they're not part of the future here um i'm just gonna move on without them sure. and so yes this is one of the reasons that high capacity men and women are energized by direct conversations is that they want to grow. They want to be transformed. They want to know their blind spots. They want to go to the next level. They want to um, have the same energy as their boss, the leader of the company. They want to be in the inner circle. They want to maximize their potential. And so they want to wrestle for the future with sharp people. And so it's actually a, a compliment. It's an affirmation when a leader is willing to initiate a difficult conversation to find a, a significant solution with me mm -hmm. or with you. Now you're actually doing the work of business. You're coming to the conflict. You're hammering out solutions that are actually going to take the company to the next level. It's interesting as you talk about that. Sometimes as, as people talk, I get these really strange images in my mind that helps me process things. And on one level, I hear you saying, you know, a compl if I'm willing to have a complicated conversation with you, it's a compliment in a sense to the desire to want to uh, journey with you. If I don't want to have a complicated conversation, it's the canary in the coal mine. It's the leading indicator that the, that the end is near in our relationship. It's, it, you know, something's going to die here. It's like the precursor. As soon as I stop having yeah. complicated and difficult conversations with, with my children, or maybe with my, with my wife or, or with my, with my, with my brothers, cause I don't have sisters with my brothers, um, or with my colleagues or right. with my clients, I'm saying something by saying I'm not, I'm no longer willing to go in there and fight it out with you because it's not worth it. That that's a tremendous statement of value or lack of value when you think about it that way. Indeed, and the communication is often happening at an unconscious level, and people get it when we say it's not worth it. What they feel is I'm not worth it. Mm. When my boss doesn't, you know, stand up to me. When we don't, he won't wrestle with me. 
I, I think maybe he doesn't think I have what it takes. Maybe he doesn't think I can contribute. Doesn't think I have got some, anything worth wrestling with. And so even if it's unconscious, it becomes very personal very quickly when we don't engage in complicated conversations in order to move together into the future in sync, in alignment. And so, yeah, that's why if you know, you're, you're afraid uh, to enter into difficult conversations as a leader, you may lose your highest capacity team members who are actually looking for a place where they're, enga- they're encouraged to fight for the best ideas fight for the best processes with those who are in charge. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, obviously, we're, we're not going to unpack this whole subject matter tonight in this conversation, you know, uh, it, but just for the time frame that we have. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you to do, Ray, is crystallize a couple of other things that you would want people to know or strategies or tools. And, and then if there's a, I, and I don't even know if there's a way practically, but if there's a way that they can, you know, if they're interested and want more information, how could they connect with you in any way? I mean, I'll leave that for you to decide. But, but if we were going to pack a couple other things, what what is it that you would want people to know? What 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 strategy? Or I to hate to use the word technique because it sounds that sounds a little bit fake. But tool, what tool could you put in their in their backpack in in in, in their tool chest that they could use in a very practical way? Well, oftentimes when I'm speaking to a person and we're, we're working through a conflict, um, one of the tools I use is marrying together unexpected kindness with uncommon directness. Hmm. And, and that's what surgeons do, right? <laughs> I remember, you know, having back surgery and I, the doctor comes in that morning and he said, you know, I said, I think I've changed my mind. I'd like the massage, please. And he smiled and he said, only the knife is going to heal you, brother. And uh, he said, we're ready to wheel you in. And that's true in our relationships as well. That like a doctor, we express unusual kindness, such as, Tim, I'm glad you're on the team. Tim, I always respect your, your, your thinking, your clear thinking and your willingness to speak what's, what's coming up for you. And Tim, I think you've crossed the line in some of your behavior. And I'm wondering if we can talk about that. Or Tim, I really appreciate, um, you know, your good work over here. However, um, I'm concerned about how you're working without a team. And uh, so we marry unusual kindness. We express respect. We affirm. We just say, I see what you're doing. I value what you're doing. I I appreciate the thought you're putting into this. I, uh, I'm glad you're on the team. And then we follow it up with, and I'm also concerned about what you're not seeing. I'm so grateful that we have the opportunity to work together. I'm so grateful that you're in this department. And I want to share with you my perspective on how things are going. It's not quite the same as yours. And so if there's a bottom line in working with people, it's marrying kindness with directness. And so people, when there's tension in the room, they don't expect kindness. They don't expect affirmation, nor do they often expect you to be so direct. And so together, you know, like gin and tonic, it's a cocktail that makes the bitter, you know, sweet and makes the sweet healing. Um, but that would be a principle that I think applies anytime we're in a situation that starts where we, we start to tense up. How do the next words I speak express both respect, affirmation, and kindness, and also are direct and to the point, speak to the core of the issue at hand? Ray, as, you, as you've articulated that tonight, I think, I mean, the penny, the, the penny just dropped for me because I noticed a nuance in, in something you just said. So unusual kindness and unusual directness don't always mix together. And I'm going to say, but, because that, and I use the word, but, because you didn't use the word, but between those two, which would negate the first thing you said. So what I just really noticed, and maybe, 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 it, maybe it wasn't strategic, but you didn't use the word but. You said, 
I, I, I love all these things that are positive about you, Tim. Typically, we would slip into the next, but say we'd say, but, and by doing that, we'd negate everything. You said and, which uh, is very powerful when you begin to think about it. Because as soon as I put but in between those two things, I've negated what I just said, but you didn't do that. Right. That That's, that's really quite brilliant. It takes a lot of work. In fact, I slipped a little bit in there, but uh, <laughs> you're absolutely right. If we say, but people think, oh no, the other shoe's about to drop. And uh, they begin to tense up. And so, yeah, uh, you know, if I can say, Tim, I love how hard you thought about this, how much time you've clearly put into it. And I think there are many valuable points that you've suggested. And my perspective is similar, but not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And I talk to you about some distinctions that I see. And so, yes, you're right. It's a discipline. It's simple, but it is a disciplined complicated conversational tool that needs to be mastered yeah. so that we do get, we get to leave the room as friends. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I remember you, you told us at the network when we were talking about this was really interesting and it tucked in a little bit too. Um, in, um, I can't remember all of my podcasts are bleeding together because I do so many, but uh, in a previous podcast, I talked about one of the, one of the things that makes people highly in, inspirational and influential, which is maintaining and being, a person who is willing to be perplexed, have questions, not have all the answers. And I talked a little bit in, in that section about the, the idea of curiosity and how that is such a powerfully influential force, maintaining a position of curiosity. And I remember there was, there was something, I can't remember exactly, but there was a question that you had encouraged us or, or a posture you encouraged us to take in that conversation that had to do with this, this idea of curiosity. Um, can you unpack that a little bit? Because I remember I found that so fascinating. It was very interesting. Well, certainly. I mean, we're so used to arguments that all of a sudden there's some tension in the room, there's some disagreement, and we expect people to just marshal their information, give us a lecture, tell us what we already know, take all kinds of time to give details that really have nothing to do with how I'm feeling right now. And we anticipate that. That's how it goes. We get a lecture and uh, we're overpowered. We might be silenced. We say what we agreed to get, get through it. We just want this meeting to be done. And so the way to intervene and the, the common expectation is for us to respond with questions and say, wow, Tim, I, I didn't see this coming. I'd like to know the thinking underneath this. I'd like to know... Uh, what's going on for you? I'd like to know how you're feeling. Um, and that's where, you know, high EQ listening comes in, where I'm really listening for what I don't know. I'm listening for what's important to you. And I may reflect that back, what I hear you saying. I may also empathize. Wow, I can see your passion. I, uh, you know, I get that you're angry, and that's important to me where I can see how this would be very discouraging. So I'm empathizing with the emotion I see. And I can even validate them and say, I don't think you're stupid. I think you've thought about this a lot. Um, and the fact that I didn't see it, or I may not even fully agree with it, doesn't mean I think you're stupid, or this point isn't worth considering. And so tell me more. Hmm. Yeah, that, so that ability to maintain a curious position um, and be inquisitive, I guess, fights against naturally against judgment. If I'm curious and inquisitive, I, it's very difficult to be judgmental at the same time. Right. Suppose, and as a manager would... or as a manager or as a leader, my job is to get you to do your best work mm -hmm. with me and for me. And so if I just write you off, if I just lay down the law, your motivation decreases your joy and your work decreases and I failed as a manager or as a leader. Yeah. And so my job at the end of the day is to keep my team fully engaged, moving together in the same direction. And so using curiosity is much more powerful than just laying down the law, laying down the law gets short-term results. I get you to comply with what I've asked you to do today but long-term, it has diminishing returns. 
where all of a sudden you have less joy coming to work, less energy, uh, you know, moving through your day. And you're now open to other recruiters who are calling you, telling you about other positions where you might go, where you you feel respected and valued. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess, you know, it's just, again, I tend to think these things start connecting in my mind as we talk. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, the complicated conversation is benefited by curiosity. There, there's, there's that, there's that connectivity for me. So, uh, so listen, I just, because I want to respect your time and the time of my listeners, cause, cause time is one of these pre, uh, diminishing resources that we all have. Once it's gone, we never get it back. Um, so I'm going to ask you to, to wrap up this conversation with, with maybe one other point that you want to make or one other encouragement that you want to make to, to, uh, on this topic. And then I have two other questions that I want to ask you and, and maybe, and it's, you know, is there a way that if people want to understand this at a deeper level or more, or maybe even interact with you, maybe you could let people know how they could do that. So, but, but one other thing you want to share on this particular topic a way that maybe people could connect with you if they want to follow up, have a deeper conversation about this complicated conversation. And then I have just two other questions I, I want to finish up our, our Encore conversation with today. Sure. Well, uh, my name is Ray Beefus. I'm on uh, LinkedIn. You can contact me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can email me, ray at highpointjourney.com. But I'd be glad to send you a, uh, an executive summary of the book, uh, Difficult Conversations how to discuss what matters most. I can send you a, a little uh, survey of, of marrying uh, kindness with directness, uncommon kindness with unexpected directness. I'm glad to send you a couple of resources that'll help you begin your journey to developing skills that'll help you um, lead the way when things get difficult or complicated. Hmm. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Ray, because I mean, one of the things that people, again, they don't, they don't know you, they're hearing, maybe they're meeting you or hearing you for the first time. And again, I go back to that winsome quality. Um, and, and when Ray offers an, uh, something to people, he does it without reservation and, and without a restriction. And that's what I appreciate about Ray. Ray has a generosity about him. It's one of the reasons why I invited Ray to be part of that network is that I knew that Ray would be a generous contributor to that that group not just somebody who would to take things but he they but you would be a contributor and you have been and i really appreciate that now now obviously the the you know so we're going to press pause on that conversation that that difficult conversation those complicated conversations for a second and if people want to discover more they can they can follow up with you or they can check out those books that you recommended great books Uh, but i'm going to press pause on that for a second obviously the overall arch you know, this sort of arc of what uh, this podcast is about for me is this idea, again, of not being a dime a dozen person, not being a commodity, uh, standing up and standing out for all the right reasons in the in the spheres and in the worlds we play in. My question to you, Ray Beefus, is how are you doing that? Like, how do you challenge yourself in the din of your, the worlds you live in? Because because coaching has become a little bit of a din. You know, there's coaches are a little bit a dime a dozen. You can find them everywhere. Now, some of them aren't real coaches, but uh, like me, they call themselves a coach, but not real coaches. Um, but how do you challenge yourself and practically stand out and stand up in a way that captures people att- people's attention? Well, I t- I, I, I've been told, and I, I think it's true, that if we move toward fear, if we move toward stress, if we move toward people in situations where emotion is over the top, we will be uncommodified. Who does that? Hmm. Who moves toward people when they're, they're not their best? They're flipping out. They're emotionally uh, over the top. They're stressed beyond the belief. Generally, we all run for cover. Uh, we all avoid, you know, stay away. Uh, it's, he's not in a good place. Stay away. She just flipped out. We, we run, and actually, that's where we can sometimes have our greatest impact through simple curiosity. Looks like you're upset. I'd love to hear what's going on. I'm sure something big is at stake. How can I support you in getting what you need? Uh, I would love to be on your team for the biggest possible win. And so uh, in a world where people run from pain, 
They run from stress, ugliness, conflict, chaos. You be the person to run toward it, like a fireman, like a police officer, like a first responder. Move toward the pain, the struggle, the chaos. That's where the gold is buried both for you, for your leader, for your team, for your family, run toward the smoke, run toward the fire and help put it out. That's great advice. And, and I've seen that, I've seen you do that. I've, I've seen you do that in situations where we've been in conflict, whether it was in Africa or in, in that boards that I talked about where you, you, you run dead, you've run dead into it with a tremendous sense of calmness. And, and that is, you're right, Ray, that is an uncommodifying action. And I, I've, I've seen that for myself because, because the typical reaction is unfortunately where I often find myself, the unusual reaction, the novel reaction, the, the uncommodified reaction is the reaction most often I've seen you take. And so I think that you've been a practitioner of these uncommodifying behaviors probably for many decades. Uh, we may not have called them that at the time. Uh, I, I wouldn't have called them that at the time, but now as I've begun to under explore this idea, I see the behavior you've exemplified. You're an exemplar of that very thing that you encourage other people to do. And that's what I respect most about you, Ray, is that you, you, you don't teach to others what you haven't possessed yourself. Uh, you've understood the principle that it is very difficult to give away what you haven't possessed. And that's what I have deep respect for you is that when you talk about these things, you possess them well. And not only do you do it, but that you, you, empower, and you, you empower and you teach other people to do it. And you, I know that you work with some very, very high level executives who, who, who this is going to be their world. If they're going to live in that world, they're going to be dealing constantly with these complicated, difficult conversations because they are dealing with those firecracker people, those people who are just like lightning, who on one level could you can set on fire and send to the moon, and another level you set on fire, they can explode right in front of you. And they're handling all of that in, in their worlds. And I know that you're a sought-after person who they, who, who they can come to who can explore these things with them. So... So listen, as we finish up, here, here's my last question to you. If you had one final just word that you could leave with people, one, one encouragement that you could leave them as we finish up, what, what would be that last word of encouragement that you want to give beyond what you've said? Well, I would go back to your podcast on Martin Luther King Jr. And that is make no person your enemy. Um, don't burn any bridges. Every difficult conversation is an opportunity to create a new ally, a new best friend, a new partner. And so be careful when you start judging people as losers, not worth it, um, enemies of the cause. They just have a different perspective. They have a different story. They have different rules. And it's your opportunity to engage in such a way that you can partner together for an unprecedented future worth living. 